EMP series, day 171. It was early when Carl Fairley walked into his office. He noticed that the door that led to the cell area was open, and he drew his forty-five. He cautiously entered into the rear area, immediately noticed that the cell door was open also, and that Lee was gone. The key that hung on the hook on the side of his desk still inserted in the lock on the cell door. He also noticed that the window leading out into the alley in the back of the building was open. He walked around and looked closely at the immediate area adjacent to the window, paying particularly close attention to the ground beneath. There were two separate and distinct boot prints in the dirt. He followed the tracks across the alley and into the woods. He ran over to the trading post to catch Zeb before he set out on the morning message run. He instructed him to go home and to bring Carl back his dog. Roy was a mixed breed, German Shepherd and Black Lab. He was trained to track specific scents. He was trained by Carl with the help of an ex-Special Forces friend who worked as a contractor training dogs for law enforcement and military contractors. Carl mainly used him for hunting, but knew he was capable of so much more. When Zeb returned with Roy, Carl brought him in and gave him the blanket and pillow that Lee had used while sleeping in the jail. Carl issued the command to go, and Roy proceeded to crisscross the room and jumped out the window. He waited anxiously in the alley for Carl to walk out and round. When he saw Carl, he immediately ran across the alley and into the woods. It didn't take him long to get to the spot where Nunez and Lee got into the waiting truck. The dog circled several times and stopped to let Carl know that the trail ended there. Carl, a skilled tracker, noticed the fresh tire tracks in the dirt and followed them on horseback until they came to the paved road. He could see that the tracks were starting to turn to the left before he lost them where the pavement started. That meant that the truck would have headed north, up on the road out of town. It could have been going anywhere. The blown-up trestle was up the road a mile or so, not a desperation, with no other idea of where the truck could have went. Carl decided to go there and try to pick the trail up. He tied his horse off to a tree on the spot where the makeshift platform was built to receive passengers and offload goods from the train where it was now forced to stop. Roy circled several times until he bolted off toward the main road. He went in that direction for several hundred feet and circled again and stopped. When Carl walked over, he noticed the same tire tracks he had seen earlier come off the main road onto the dirt lot and stopped where Roy was sitting. Good boy, Carl announced. That's a good boy, as he patted his head gently. Carl snapped his fingers and again issued the command for Roy to move out, pointing in the direction of the boot prints leading away from where the tire tracks ended. Roy again bolted off and ran to a few feet away from where the twisted track wreckage jutted out over the cliff. There, Carl saw signs of blood and what appeared to be something having been dragged to the edge. Whatever it was, it seemed to disappear over the edge of the cliff. Then... In the other direction, back toward where the tire tracks stop, was one set of boot tracks. Carl had a good idea of what had happened, as he strained to look out over the cliff's edge. 
His only question now was, whose body would he find at the bottom? Lee or the person who helped him escape? Carl got back on his horse and whistled for Roy to follow. He rode down into the valley and along the river's edge to underneath where the trestle once crossed the river gorge. He looked around and it only took him a minute to spot the lifeless, bloodied remains of Lee's body. He was pretty messed up from the fall, but it was clearly Lee. Carl ordered Roy to stay put as he roped off the scene. The last thing he needed was the dog running around messing up the area. He would find no tracks or other useful evidence there, but he wanted time to process the scene undisturbed to make sure. Later that day, Carl sat at his desk, pondering all he had seen this morning. He worked out several plausible theories in his head, until one by one he either reached a dead end or a point of inconclusiveness. He needed more evidence, more information. Carl was like a pit bull as an investigator. Once he bit hold of something, he would not let it go, no matter what. To the point even where he could become obsessed with it. He just kept running things over in his mind. It was no use. There were just too many missing pieces. One question was soon to be answered, however. The coroner sent word to Carl that the man at the bottom of the cliff was now ready for an autopsy. He was in the morgue, spread out on the table. Carl jogged over and viewed Lee's body. There, above his left breast, was the tattoo that identified him as a tunnel rat the same tattoo that Buddy Tanner and the Hammer both had above their left breast also. He now knew that the three were connected. But with Lee dead, this info hardly seemed to matter anymore. Carl thought about Roger and the likelihood that he too was once part of this same MC. He thought about sending a rider to fetch him back. He was only about three days out. Carl knew that traveling with Callie and the kids would be slow going and that he could easily be overtaken in a day or so by a hard rider. He thought about Callie and the kids and all that they had been through. He thought about Roger and his glorious salvation and everything that he had been through, and all the changes he had made in his life. Then he thought about what possible impact he could have on the investigation. What info could he really have that could help Carl? Then he thought again about Callie and the kids, and how desperate they were to reunite with her family. He decided not to send after Roger. No, Roger was free, and as long as Carl had a say in it, he would remain that way. Just then there was a knock on the door as it opened. A man Carl had never seen walked in. Carl asked, can I help you? The man told Carl he wanted to speak to the sheriff. I'm the constable, Carl informed him. Name's Carl Fairley. What can I do for you, sir? Uh, My name is Frank. I'm here with my wife and daughter. He motioned to the woman and young girl sitting on the bench on the platform outside the office. I'm here because I want to report something that we saw last night out by the dam. We were camping up in the woods... Been there a little while now, and last night we saw a fire down by the dam. I went down to take a look, and I saw a truck burning out of control. There was nobody around. 
The thing is, when I was walking down the trail from my camp toward the fire, I saw a man walking up the trail, away from the truck. He didn't see me before I hid and let him pass. It was dark. All I could see was he had blondish hair, about six foot tall or so, average build. He was walking at a pretty brisk pace. I don't know if it's important or not, but I figured I should report it to you. Carl thanked him, and when he turned to walk out, Carl noticed the tattoo he had on his arm. He was wearing a sleeveless t-shirt, and it was clear as day. It was a pair of jump wings over a skull wearing a beret. Frank! Carl called out. Frank stopped and turned around toward Carl. Carl nodded at his tattoo and asked, Airborne, huh? Frank smiled and responded, Yeah, in another life. Carl motioned over to the picture on the wall with him in Afghanistan with his unit. 101st. In country for two tours, Carl announced. Frank smiled and hesitated. 82nd from Fort Bragg. Two tours myself. They compared notes and realized that Carl was there well before Frank was. Carl asked Frank why they were camping up by the dam. Frank told Carl that after the EMP attack... The apartment they lived in in the city was looted. Four gang members broke in one night and were taking anything they can get their hands on. Frank told Carl that when he came out of the bedroom to confront them, that they got into it pretty quickly. Frank told Carl that he got hit in the back with a chair and that he killed two of the intruders and he knocked the third one out. The fourth man ran out and called for help. And when Frank looked down the street, he saw a bunch of them running toward the apartment. His wife already had their daughter up and their bug out bags in their hands. They fled and barely made it into the alley and hid in a dumpster as the gang ran by. They got out after they passed and they ran back in the other direction. They didn't stop running until the next morning. We really don't have much. We've been moving around ever since. I pick up odd jobs when I can, but there hasn't been much lately. Carl looked him over, and then he looked out at his family. He thought to himself how this young man struggling to survive and provide for and protect his family took the time to come in and report the truck fire. Carl knew it was somehow related to Lee's murder. He asked Frank, When's the last time you all ate? Uh, Two days ago, answered Frank. Shot a rabbit and forged for some blackberries. He smiled at the thought of it. Well, said Carl, Go over to the diner and order yourselves a meal on the county. He wrote out a note and gave it to Frank. Give this to the man at the diner. You'll be all set. Uh, No thanks, Sheriff. I ain't one to take charity, answered Frank. Good, because I ain't one to offer it, replied Carl. This is my office's way of saying thanks for coming forward. You may have just provided key info for a brand new murder investigation. The least we can do is buy you lunch. I'd rather work for it, said Frank. Carl sat back in his chair and put his hands behind his head. He paused for a moment and said, Okay, Airborne. He reached in his desk drawer and pulled out a badge, tossed it at him. Just so happens I'm short one deputy. Don't pay much. Cash is sporadic and 
doesn't come in regularly since the bank shut down. There may be a little here and there, but I can't promise you any, really. I'll pay in groceries at the trading post. You can go over once a week and get what you need. Or what they have, anyway. I'll make up the difference with fresh milk and eggs from my homestead. The job only pays enough food for one, though, I'm afraid. Uh, that's okay. I'll stretch it out. We'll make do. Well, said Carl, I could offer your wife work as well. Frank just looked at him, not sure what to make of that. Before he could respond, Carl continued. My wife Abigail could use a hand on the homestead. With me being here so much, she has a ton to do. Milking cows and canning and dehydrating the fruits and veggies. Planting, weeding, picking the gardens. Pretty much anything that needs to be done. That job pays all that y'all could ever need or want to eat. And you'll all have to be on site because Abby starts real early. There's a guest cottage on the homestead and you could stay in it. I gotta warn you though, Abigail's a hard worker and she'll expect the same from anyone who works with her. Last two people quit within a week. Frank smiled. That won't be a problem. My Sharon loves hard work. Sarah, our daughter, can work with her. She's old enough to learn how to be a productive member of society. Thanks, said Carl. It takes a lot of pressure off me. With all we got going on here, I've been spread pretty thin. I'll take you out to meet the family after y'all have lunch. Take your time eating at the diner. I need about an hour or so here before I'll be ready to go anyway. Frank smiled and nodded as he took the note and walked out to take his family across the street to eat. Carl smiled, sat back in his chair.